Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, give thanks to Yahweh and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders and glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Let's call upon God together. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Your king greets you. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess that God has revealed himself and we have come to worship the triune God as summarized for us in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. Third day he rose again, according to the scripture. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Let us now sing Psalm 84. We will sing the three stanzas on page 8. Uh, this will be verses 1 through 7. O Lord of hosts, how lovely, an affirmation of the great delight of the believer to be in the house of the Lord in the presence of the saints. Oh, 
Please be seated. Beloved, God has called us into his presence that we would know that he is God and that he has made us and that we live in this wonderful world. But we must come before him and admit that we have actually been selfish and we have not been thankful for what we have. That explains all of our sinful actions. So we need to again return to the law of God and understand God as he reveals himself clearly, first in creation, more clearly, of course, in the written word, and understand our relation to him and realize that it is not well if we approach him in our own righteousness, but it will be well if we approach through Jesus Christ. So let us learn to set aside our self-righteousness from the law and learn to rest in Jesus Christ. So let us again remind ourselves of the use and purpose of the law of God. God's law displays his holiness and perfection. It is given as my only sure guide to knowing his will and pleasing him. But as a fallen man, I cannot obey the law. I turn to the law to see my sinfulness, that I may be humbled and confess my sins before God, because he declares, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. I will not be justified by the works of the law. So let us then hear the law to know where we have fallen short. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Several things come out as we read the commandments. Uh, first, the negative. God tells us that we are to have a relation with him and he governs this relationship. And we have to understand that, it, as Jesus says, it is a expression that we love God with heart, soul, and mind. And then in the second half, he speaks of how we are to relate to our neighbor. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves and promote his good. And as we go through each commandment individually with the catechism summaries, it helps us to understand more fully the correct disposition and application of the law. But there's also the 10th commandment that makes it very clear God is interested not only in the outward actions, but the intent of the heart. And to simply be legalists who perform external acts will not meet the standards of the law because we are to have a disposition that says, I know God is my God, a good God who makes provision for me, and that I need to learn to be content with my situation and be thankful. But in all this, where we discover how we've sinned against him, whether or not loving him as we should or our neighbor, we have to understand even here, the law is given to those whom he has rescued. I am the God who loved you, who remembered my promises, who rescued you. And it is in that light that now we can go before God and say, yes, we know our sinful condition. We're not coming here claiming our own righteousness, but we've also heard your promise. We believe the gospel. We know that you will do what you have said, and we know, therefore, there is the hope of life, redemption from death itself in those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So let us go before God and confess our sins with a heartfelt confidence in the deliverance 
already accomplished on the cross by Jesus Christ. God has sent his son Jesus in the likeness of my sinful flesh as an offering for my sin. In doing this, God demonstrates his electing love for me in that Christ died for me, the sinner. That no one is justified by the law before God is clear, for the man who by faith is righteous shall live. I don't have a righteousness that is my own from my obedience to the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I believe that I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from my own works and attempts to follow the law. We've put a lot of weight on this idea of faith, so it's good for us to understand what is faith. So the Catechism summarizes it. Beloved, what is faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. It is also a wholehearted trust, which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel, that God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace, only because of Christ's merits. Assured then that for the sake of Christ our sins will be forgiven, confess, be open, know what God already knows, and confess them before God and ask for forgiveness and restoration and sanctification as we go on in life. Let's pray. We come before you, our God, knowing that you are a holy God and that you hate sin. And we are fools who sin against you and expect good to still come for us, that we are going to outsmart you or somehow manage to undo our wickedness. We pray that by your spirit, you will give to us a right understanding that there is no hope in ourselves and there's no work we can do to fool you or turn away your wrath. You require perfect righteous obedience. You demand sinners to die and pay for their debts. Our only hope is if a substitute is sent to stand in our place, to fulfill the righteousness the law requires and to die the sinner's death the law requires. And we are before you this day rejoicing that a substitute was sent, and this substitute was perfect, that the only begotten Son of God, the eternal second person of the Trinity, took on our flesh and died the sinner's death for us on the cross, and now your wrath has been poured out on him as he chose to take our wrath upon himself. And because of this, the gospel has been now been preached to us, and we are able to rejoice. Help us, therefore, to have a true living faith, confident in Jesus Christ, and to believe all things work together for our salvation. May we, therefore, come before you, call you God our Father, thank you, and praise you. Let us also remember that we belong to your family. Your spirit dwells in us, and we are now called to have a zeal for good works and righteousness, a love for you with heart, soul, and mind and a love for our neighbor as ourselves. So we pray that you will work in us this transformation, this conformity to Christ that you have willed and you've promised to do. And we ask as these things are done that our worship will be even more thankful, more zealous, and our love for you and for our neighbor more full and more desirous of service. So we thank you, O oh God, that you did not give to us what we deserved, but you've given us life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Beloved, let us stand and hear that summary of Scripture that declares our new condition in Jesus Christ. Beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven, the record of your transgressions is blotted away, and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ, who will resurrect you in the last day. And so we respond by singing the closing verses of Psalm 51, 
asking God not only that he would forgive, we've already asked that and he has granted it, but now that we would be conformed to his image and that he would build up the real Jerusalem, which is the church of Jesus Christ. So Psalm 51, and this is roughly verses 10 through 19, gracious God, my heart renew. Gracious God, my heart renew, make my spirit right and true, cast me not away from thee, let thy spirit dwell in me, thy salvation's joy impart, steadfast make my Sinners then shall learn from me, and return, O God, to Thee. Savior, all my guilt remove, and my tongue shall sing Thy love. Touch my silent lips, O Lord, and Not the formal sacrifice has acceptance in thine eyes. Broken hearts are in thy sight more than sacrificial right. Contrite spirit pleading cries thou Prospers I on in thy grace, and a broken walls replace. Then a righteous sacrifice shall delight thy holy eyes. Free will offerings gladly made. Please be seated. As we go before God, let us turn then again to page 16, and we see we have come to that end of the year when we have prayed through all the nations, and now we are praying for the entire world. Uh, we'll also add to our prayers this day Thanksgiving for the birth of Kieran. Uh, we are also thankful to God. We have prayed for Reverend Folkerts in Uganda who had been mugged and robbed and how uh, he's been, he and his family are recovering well. We prayed for the 17 kidnapped Christians in Haiti and they have been freed. But we continue to pray for the persecuted Christians in Nigeria and Pakistan in particular as they are still suffering greatly. So we ask that the Lord would continue to be merciful to them. Let's pray. Our great and holy God, we rejoice that you are the exalted King of kings and Lord of lords, that you rule over all. We pray that we would understand, though we are not yet able to see you in your full glory, that you are indeed sovereign over all creation and all things will work together for your people, for your precious body. We pray that we would understand our station, our unity with Christ, our head, and how we are called now to suffer for a little while that we may be glorified with him. So we ask now that as we continue to live our lives, as we come to the end of one year and we look forward to the new year, we would know and understand what it means to be your precious possession. We come before you understanding that you have been with us always. You have led us in all things. You have granted us much in this day. You've granted to us so much that we cannot even remember. Every breath we take, every glass of water we drink, every meal we've had is a gift from you. But Lord, we've also undergone times of troubles and tribulations, and these we remember too well, and we complain, and we fail to recognize that during these times we are being trained up, that no one who accomplishes much has it easy, but they are to be trained up. And so we ask you will give to us a right disposition a heart that 
desires and delights in you and is confident in your promises and goes through times of tribulation without complaining but with perseverance and with prayer. We pray for our own congregation. We pray for our federation. Lord, we know that we are an unglorified people and yet called to be holy. We are people who have sinned against you and yet we are also all people see of you in the world and we have a service we owe to the body, the church. So we pray that as we look back upon the year, we will see our failings, recognize our shortcomings and confess these things and pray that not only would we be forgiven but transformed, that we would understand our weaknesses and fight against them and we would learn to love and serve one another delighting in doing what is good in your sight and benefits our neighbor. We pray also that we would recognize where you've used us and be thankful that you would take these vessels of clay and show your glory in us, something we did not deserve. May we find it the greatest honor in the world that you've put your name upon us and you use us to benefit the children whom you loved and whom you delivered from death to life. So we pray for our ministry going forward, as well as our fellowship with Christ and with one another. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bind us together in love with a desire to do service and good for one another using the unique gifts and talents we each have been given. We pray also for the works we are privileged to know and support, particularly Ventura and Armenia. We ask that these works would be blessed, that they would become more fruitful, that we may look upon them and see your handiwork, and rejoice in the many things you will do through them in the years to come. This time we also remember to thank you for the blessings that we have seen. We thank you for the Folkerts being kept healthy and safe and restored despite the troubles that they went through. And we rejoice to see that the kidnapped missionaries have been restored. But during this time we know that while all things will work together for good and you will bless your people, we also know many of your people suffer greatly, and the things we hear coming out of some nations are terrifying, especially what Christians are undergoing in Nigeria, and we cry for them because we cannot be there to help them. But we know it is by your will that you are training them up, and as they suffer much, we sometimes stare and wonder what amazing works you intend to do and to glorify your name through them. But for now, Please strengthen our sisters and brothers as they suffer so horribly under the wickedness of Islam. We pray the same especially for the very poor and outcast believers of Pakistan. Lord, we know that there is much more suffering ordained for them and we are troubled and we cannot do anything but pray. So give to us a zeal to pray and we ask that you will give to them the strength to persevere and to glorify your name in the midst of their enemies, that even their enemies would be ashamed of what they are doing and turn to you. And we pray for the whole world. Lord, we ask that this coming year will not be like last year, that it will be a better year for evangelism and missions. We pray that as we ask you to remember many peoples that are in darkness, like large tens, hundreds of millions of the Hindi who are caught up in the lies of reincarnation and other foolishness, that this will be a year that we shall see you pour out your grace and call many to yourself. We ask that we should see many tribes and tongues and nations and peoples no longer stumble about blindly in idolatry, but that these believers whom you will call to yourself will put us to shame in their zeal. And we will thank you for giving to us new sisters and brothers around the world. So we come to you this day and pray for particular needs also. We have members who are sick. We ask that you'll give them bodily healing. We have those who are troubled for family members who are absenting themselves from church or who are falling away. We pray that they should yet see and soon you restoring our fallen sisters and brothers to faith, calling them back to yourself. We pray for those who are sick and we pray for, especially for the King family as they are concerned for Stephen's brother. We ask, O oh Lord, in these things that we should see your healing hand and your power and that you give to us a heartfelt confidence even as we look forward to our own mortality, knowing that while we are away from the body, we will be with you forevermore. And Lord, we thank you that you have given to Chris and to Mary Rose this new child. And now we pray for this and all the children of the church. You alone are able to preserve them 
We ask that you will give to us wisdom and desire that they should be led up in the way of truth, that they should see in us a sinful people who are willing to forgive one another and strive to live in peace, that they would understand the power of the Spirit. We ask that you would be with this church and mature us so that more and more we will have the mind of Christ and that the words that we speak will not sound hypocritical to anyone who hears it, but that shall see behind it all a people who love others, even their enemies, and pray for their persecutors so that many more will be saved. And now we come before you confident that your promises are true for us, and we are now adopted, your children, and we can call the Creator, enthroned on high in glory, our Father, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let us now stand for the reading of the written word of the Lord. Let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament, Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. But now, thus says Yahweh, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Hosea 11, 8 and 9. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Turning to the New Testament, John chapter 6, 39 and 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 10, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. John 15, 13 through 14, 15. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the, his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Romans 3, 9 and 10. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as is written. None is righteous, no, not one. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Romans 8, 37 through 39. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. So far, the reading of the written word. We pray to you, our God, give to us a desire to hear your word, to understand your word, to have your word powerfully transform us, conforming us to the image of Christ, and to lead us to do the good works of righteousness and innocence, which are pleasing to you, that strengthen our faith and are used by you to take the gospel to the nations. We pray that of all people, we will hear these words and find true comfort in the revelation. We have been purchased by Jesus Christ to be his possession. May we delight in this and praise you all the more each day. Amen. Please be seated. We come now to the end of a year that, of course, has been less than ideal. And the worst thing for us to do right now would be to only hope that next year will be better, because that is a false hope. There will be some good things, some bad things, but that is not where we should have our hope, and that is not where we should find our comfort. What we need to do is wrestle with reality as it is. And throughout world philosophy, there's always been the two camps, those who say all the world is flux, there is nothing stable, everything changes, is random. And those who say, no, all is static, everything is established, and it's going to go to a fixed end. And the reason philosophers argue about this is that they're both true. But in philosophy, there's no way to reconcile it. Either it's chaotic and random, and so, in a way, it really doesn't matter what you do, because in the end, nothing matters. Or everything is static and fixed, and it doesn't matter what you do. In the end, nothing matters. But the reality is God has given to us an incredible, dynamic, and exciting time in which to live, where we are able to do things, to think, and to act, and our actions have purpose and meaning. But at the same time, it's also static in that he has guaranteed that by his will, he will uphold and preserve for himself a people, and they shall inherit everlasting life, even if we should make decisions that are wrong outright, but also ones in a worldly level that seem unwise, that lead us to poverty and ultimately death. But God says, fear not, I am with you. So what we see is that all of these dilemmas are reconciled in Jesus Christ by the will of God, and therefore it is to us a comfort. Why is this important? As I said, it would be a terrible thing if you put your hope in next year being better. Because it may be, it may not be. If it is, great, you have some material blessings, better, maybe better health, better wealth, whatever it is. But you're still mortal. In the end, it's not going to last. And if you put your hope in next year and it turns out to be worse, well, that's bad too. Because then you've got nothing that was all you were waiting on. But remember what we have just seen in the catechism many times. My comfort in life and in death is I belong to Jesus Christ. You were purchased with a price. You were purchased for a, pur you were purchased for a purpose that God would have for himself a people zealous for good works. And we've seen that zeal is a fulfillment of the law of God, that we love him, that we love our neighbor, that we serve our neighbor, and that he receives the glory. So what we need to see here as we come to the end of the year, we realize we don't follow the ways of this world. Our treasure is not in this world, and our comfort is not found ultimately in this world. And so what is going to be our comfort? Where are we going to rest? Well, I hope it will be where God tells us to, in Jesus Christ. Recognizing that God has willed for us 
an eternal inheritance and that he will make the payment. So two weeks ago, we sang comfort, comfort my people. Well, that's what we are reading here, Isaiah 40. God tells his prophets as they are speaking to a rebellious people who are building idols and worshiping them in the temple. God says, I am going to punish, but the punishment is meant to close out the account, to train you up, to restore you. And so, Isaiah, my prophet, go to my people and declare, comfort says your God. And when you do so, speak with tenderness and let them know that their, the war, the hostility that their rebellion has brought has ended because their sins are pardoned. The record of their transgressions is blotted away. In fact, God tells Isaiah to continue in chapter 43. Let my people know, the people whom I made, whom I chose out of nothing to make my own, that I am a redeemer. There is nothing for them to fear, that they belong to me and therefore their future, their life is my interest. And so when you go through the waters, the waters won't overwhelm you. In the fire, it will not burn you because I will be with you. He doesn't say there won't be floods or fires, but he says, through it all, I will be with you. It will be a time of training, but you need to consider, I am still speaking to you. First it was, of course, through the prophets, then ultimately through the great prophet, Jesus Christ, and then the sent ones of Christ, the apostles who went out and brought the message, and now the ministers who are called to study and interpret this word, receiving no new revelation. God wants you reconciled to himself. God wants you to know that you cannot do for yourself what you need, and he will do it for you. And so through the midst of the trials and tribulations that are all going to come to us, prophet Hosea gave this word to Israel. I cannot give you up. I cannot come against you in wrath and execute judgment. Because I am God, I'm not a man. I love too much. As much as my holiness and my justice requires ultimate payment from you, I love you too much to take it from you. And so your sin will be paid for but I will pay it myself. I will not come against you in wrath. I will come to you with words of mercy. I will come to you and bring you grace. And when I do, it will be effective. It will be perfect. Now, we always tend to think of punishments as being effective, but not love, because all of us have done good for others, loved others, and people have not cared betrayed us. But boy, when you punch someone in the face and break their nose, it stays broken for a while. If you shoot them, they stay dead. So that's how we tend to think. But God says, when I love, that remains forever. And so Jesus, as he is ministering to a sinful people, as the day of redemption has come, tells them, this is the will of God the Father, of Yahweh, eternal God, that I will lose nothing of those who are my inheritance, those given to me. I will raise you up on the last day. It is the Father's will. If you look to the Son, if you hope in me, everyone who believes will have eternal life. I will raise you up on the last day. God testifies, I'm not a man. My love remains forever and my love is effective and my love delivers you and you will obtain the blessing. I will raise you up on the last day. And then Jesus continues on, John 10. If the Father has given you to me, you will hear my voice. You will not stay dead in the grave. Though there is a rebellious, sinful people who will not hear, but not for my elect. Even if they are the valley of dry bones, when my prophet speaks, they will rise up. And now when the minister speaks the word of the prophet, 
The Spirit of God continues to go forth, and so my sheep hear my voice, and they will follow me, and when they do, I give them eternal life. And those to whom I give eternal life, these ones will never perish, and nobody is going to be able to trick them or cause them to fall away. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And it's not just my hand that upholds them, but the Father's hand upholds them because I and the Father are one. And how will you know this is good for you? Because you're my friends. And what does it mean that you are my friends? I will lay down my life for you. Now, this is something that you know when you've had a good friend, especially a long-term friend. You've done things just because it just struck you. My friend would like this. My friend would enjoy it. And so you do it. And literally, when you've done these things, you have not wanted or expected anything back. It never occurred to you because you did it out of love. But none of you died for someone without thinking of it. But here's Jesus saying, my love for you is such that I will lay down my life for you. And when he uses the word friend, he does so to express not his superiority, but his humility, that he considers you his equal in this relationship. What a remarkable thing. I want you to think of me as your friend, and I will be open with you. I will not hide things from you, so I tell you my will. A servant does not know the will of his master. He has no right to. He simply follows orders, but a friend knows what delights his friend. And Jesus says, I've opened my heart to you. I've revealed that to you. And I will die for you in, as part of this relationship. This is not natural. Naturally, you see in Romans 3, 9, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. No one has done what is right in the sight of God. All are condemned naturally to death. But to you who I am speaking with, this is not you. You are the people who have been made alive through the preached word by the Spirit of God and now are led by the Spirit to be the descendants of God, the sons of God. You were not given a spirit to transform you from dead to slave, but one that made, took you from death to son of God in Christ. So you cannot fall back into the confusion and the fear of the world not knowing the future. Living in a world of flux that has no way of having a positive outcome. No. You belong to Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of history who has willed that you shall not fall away or be snatched away or stay in the grave, but that he will raise you up on the last day and give you life to the full. So you have received the adoption as sons by which you can cry to the creator of heaven and earth, Father. And since the Spirit is testifying this in your hearts, that you are children of God, you know you will inherit all the treasures of heaven, which is God himself. And you will be a fellow heir with Jesus Christ. But note the warning there. In this time, suffering with him, demonstrating that you belong to him because the world hated him and because you belong to him, the world hates you. So if you do not have some alienation from the world and some suffering, you probably don't belong to Christ. If you do, there is going to be some tribulations, but in all this, it is leading you to eternal glory that we cannot ask for or imagine. In fact, by the end of the chapter, 37 through 39, having looked at the hatred that the world pours out upon the people of God, the persecutions we are to undergo, to the point that he quotes the Old Testament saying, we are as sheep to be slaughtered, does he say, well, then kind of like, be helpless, go hide in a corner and just pray? No. He goes, actually, you think of yourself as the triumphant victor in all this. You don't look at something that seems impossible and give up. That's what losers do. But what do people who have confidence do? They look at it and they say, I know it's going to be work. 
and I know I'm going to triumph. Swimming the English Channel, going to the moon, learning calculus. I don't know what it is in particular, for, but it's that sense of the difficulty is there, but there's a reward I'm assured of, I'm confident. So Paul says, in all these things, in all the horrors that I've laid out that is possible for you, know this, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I am convinced, I'm sure, positive, death or life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, any sort of powers, high depth, anything you can think of or name in all creation, including your own lazy or stubborn or rebellious will, nothing is going to separate you from the love of God. How can I be so confident? Because God's love is yours in Jesus Christ. To the Corinthians, he articulates this in this way. Don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are no longer your own. You were purchased. You were bought with a price. In this case, he says, as a consequence, glorify God in your body. Whereas in Romans, he said, because you belong to Jesus Christ, be confident that in all your tribulations, you will overcome. And to his young protege, Titus, he writes, the grace of God has appeared, obviously in Jesus Christ, bringing salvation for all people, not just the hope to the Jews, training us to renounce this worldly ways, ungodliness, worldly passions, and instead, knowing our treasures in heaven to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives today, in this present age, and waiting for our blessed hope. Think about it. That's part of the motivation for not sinning. Sinning says, I want it now in this present age. A more sanctified way of thinking says, I can live self-controlled because my inheritance is God in the age to come. So I wait for my blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how do I know he will come? Because he has already given himself to redeem me on the cross. He's already done the difficult part, the humiliation, the suffering of death, drinking the cup of wrath at the hand of God. Coming back to claim me? That's the easy part. Of course he's going to do that, bringing the final work of redemption and purifying us from all lawlessness so that we would be then perfectly, but now even, a people that are his possession and who have a zeal, a passion for executing good works. So where should your comfort lie? Hoping that you're going to think and do better next year? Hoping the general situation will change because it's ordained to be better? I can't promise you either of those. And no matter what, within a few years again, we're mortal. We're going to get sick. We're going to the grave. No comfort is to be found in this ultimately. The rest, I mean, you can have distraction. You can have false comforts that will eventually fail you. You can live with blind wish and hope of the future. Or you can have a comfort that is unchanging, in, impossible for this to fail. And that is, I belong to Jesus Christ. So catechism question and answer one, as you see there, it's kind of a longer answer, but yes, it can be memorized, it should be. But there's also a children's edition that was produced to help from the youngest children to learn it. And it summarized it all to, you know, what's your comfort? And the answer was, I belong to Jesus. And I think that captures the whole thing. The question and answer as we have it now gives you a more full orb understanding that as you grow and mature, I hope you will not only understand, but believe and find comfort in. But the end of it is, I belong to Jesus. Why do I have comfort in a world like this, where I don't have control, where I know I'm going to eventually die? Because I belong to Jesus. Eternal God loved and purchased me. What exactly is going to happen in this world that the all-powerful God is going to let me suffer any harm? Ultimately, nothing. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. But remember, you have to go through hard work to get something worthwhile. And so 
we don't look at it now as punishments because as you see he told through the prophet Hosea I'm God I'm not a man I don't need to flick you around because you've done something wrong no this is a time of training for you as my precious child to whom I'm given my, I have given my name and in whom I am building my image, conforming you more to the image of my beloved, only begotten, eternal Son. So I'm not coming to you in wrath. I'm coming to you with grace and mercy. And I will keep you. I will raise you up. I will give you life to the full. So we've done this often after our confession of sin. But now let's do it as an affirmation of our confidence. Beloved, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So what's your comfort? I belong to Jesus. He purchased me because of that. Any suffering I undergo, to the least amount, a hair falling from my head, is ordained by the will of a father who loves me, has a goal and a destiny for me, and is training me up to that. In fact, I'm so confident. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I know it has a purpose, meaning working out my salvation. And as a consequence, the Spirit of God gives me a zeal, a passion to live for the glory of God. That means that we, in our thoughts, words, and deeds, love and worship and serve God with all our heart, soul, and mind. It also means that there's an outworking of this. We love our neighbor as ourselves. We desire his good to the extreme that Paul says we even pray for our persecutors. And in this, as we've seen also in the Catechism summary, God receives the glory. I am more assured his spirit is working in me. The world has to glorify him as they see his power. And it will cause many to see the light and come to find life in Jesus Christ. So, beloved, this is it. As this year closes out, we go to the new year. This is where our comfort lies. Everything else is secondary. I belong to Jesus Christ. That is your great hope. And it is sure. And that's what's so beautiful about it. As we pray, I will read the prayer listed for the New Year's. Almighty and most gracious God, as we close out this year, we thank you for all your tender mercies bestowed upon us during the whole course of our lives and especially during this past year. Accept our thanksgivings for all your blessings. Fill our hearts with humility and love, with gratitude and trust. For all these blessings, we offer you the sacrifice of praises, and we acknowledge that through your great goodness and help, we are enabled to live our lives in peace even though we have offended you in countless ways. O oh, merciful God, pardon all who sincerely repent of their sins. Grant that while our years are passing away, we may work out our salvation with fear and trembling in the time you give us. Enable us to press onward, always toward the end of our heavenly calling, even that blessed eternity which Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord has prepared for us. Amen. Well, beloved, let us then continue by singing the second half of Psalm 84, affirming the great joy that belongs to those who are in the house of God. And as we see in Revelation, the church is the bride of Christ and the house of God. Let us stand and sing the second half of Psalm 84. Lord God of hopes in mercy, my supplication hear. Almighty and all faithful, our Father's God give ear. Our shield and great defender, no longer hide thy face, but look upon Thy servant, anointed by thy grace, in thy 
courts to worship my God a single day is better than a thousand while far from thee I stray though in a lowly station the service of my Lord I choose above all pleasures that sinful Please be seated. We are blessed and we are weak, so we don't sometimes do not believe it, and God knows our weakness. And so the Lord's Supper is given to testify to us of the reality of the presence of God and of God being our Father, that He is caring and nourishing us. And so as we come to the table of the Lord, it is not meant to be come, uh, accepted flippantly by anyone, but you are saying, Yes, I renounce the things of this world and my Hope is to be found in Jesus Christ. I am coming affirming I don't want comfort from anything other than Jesus Christ. And so, beloved, as you are called to come to the table, do not come if you do not believe. Do not come if Christ alone is not your only hope in life and in death. But if he is, as weak as you may feel, as much as you have sinned, this is the time to come in order that your faith would be strengthened as God works in us a mystery, testifying, you really are my children. I do love you. Be assured that through, as we said, go through the rivers of water, I'll be with you, and in the fire, I will keep it from burning you. This is a testimony of that great promise. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, so do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now for all who are living in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we ask you to abstain. Nevertheless, for any of you who've confessed your sins, affirmed your faith in Christ alone, the promise is sure. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. Understand, you're invited to the sacred meal not because you are worthy in yourself by the works that you have done, but because you're clothed in Christ's works, his merits, his perfect righteousness. So don't allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table. It's given to you because of your weakness and because of your failures to increase your faith by feeding you with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And as the word has promised us God's favor, our Heavenly Father has added this conf confirming sign of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners. The table's ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through these holy mysteries, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. Our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, much less in bread and wine. We know he is in heaven, where he continues his ministry interceding on our behalf. But through the mystery of the supper, by your own word and spirit, 
These common elements are now set apart from common use. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe. We will receive in this meal nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we come to you, our Heavenly Father, and the table you have set to receive the gift of God for our souls. Amen. Beloved, that we may be nourished with Christ, the true bread from heaven. Let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, who is our advocate, who is seated at the right hand of his Heavenly Father, firmly believing all of his promises, not doubting we really will be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood, this by the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, as surely as we will receive physically bread and wine in remembrance of him. Beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. Please come forward to receive the elements and return to your seats and we'll partake together. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh anointed me to bring good news to those who are afflicted, sending me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord where there's restoration and vengeance against the enemies of God. Time for comforting all who are in sorrows and mourning, granting those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, and the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so that they will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that God may receive the glory. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The punishment for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, go astray, each of us turning to his own way. And the Lord caused our sins to fall upon him. So now every one of you who thirsts, come to the waters. And even if you have no money, come buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why would you spend your money on bread which does not satisfy? Listen to me. Delight in abundance. Incline your ear. Come to me here that your soul may live. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Jesus came to bring comfort hope and life to people who were in darkness. And if they understood what that darkness meant, that they were in sin and that they could not undo what they had done, nor did they have any hope going forward of righteousness, they would remain in darkness. But Jesus gave to them the hope of life and he showed them why there was light, because he was the light. And he told his disciples that night, I am the bread. And so he took the bread, he broke it and declared, this is my body. My body is broken for you in judgment that you would have life. So, beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe Christ's body broken for you. Jesus took the cup and declared, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It fulfills the promises. All the shadows are now going to go away and the blessings are going to be poured out on you. So take, drink, remember, believe my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins and to purge you and give you life everlasting.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the great mystery of this holy feast. Although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it's by your invitation and dressed in Christ's righteousness that we've come boldly into the Holy of Holies, and instead of receiving wrath, we've received your pardon. In the place of fear, you've given us hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you, and even now is interceding for us at your right hand. So please strengthen us by these gifts so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on your name, we may by your spirit honor you with our souls and bodies to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved, when we give our offerings, we should never give them out of a sense of rote and ritual or seeking to please God by them. They are to be an expression of our thankfulness to God and an acknowledgement that it's all His. He gave it to us, but also an expression of our desire. We want to help the poor among us, and we want to see that the gospel be preached and missionaries be sent out. So it is a participation in the ministry of the church with a thankful heart. And so that is the, that's the only way for the offerings to be of any value. If you were to give everything you owned but without thankfulness to God, it would mean nothing. So I hope that whenever we give to God, and whenever we attend worship, we never do so out of a sense of obligation or rote, but out of a desire of being among, in the company of the one who has loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son. Uh, the offerings will be available to, or to be collected in the back. Let us now conclude by singing our Trinitarian doxology on page 7. Please stand. Praise God. Our closing benediction of the year, words that you have heard many times, believe that is the promise of God for you. Yahweh the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his abundant peace. And through the tribulations ordained for you, know you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus because he loves you. Be assured, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. God's love for you is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.